The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. If you've got an idea you'd like to see built, why not send it to The Ben Heck Show? Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to be revisiting my original video game mod, the Atari 2600 VCSP Portable. I took an Atari 2600 game system and made it into a portable unit. We're going to bring that old unit on the show, open it up and let you laugh at my soldering, and then we're going to reproduce it using our modern equipment. Let's get started, shall we? So this is the original Atari 2600 portable that I first made back in the year 2000. And today's project, we're going to kind of recreate it as best we can for modern audiences. So let's take it apart and look at my awful old soldering job, which, you know, will be funny for everyone. And then we will kind of copy it into a new design. <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> so <laughs> here's the Atari board. We can cut it down smaller than that. Um, here's the cartridge connection. Very efficiently done. Here's an old pocket TV. Remember those? See how the video from the Atari is going into it? And one thing that isn't original on this is the little controller board for the controls right here. I actually replaced that several years ago with tax which is because the original uh, etched circuit board, the copper, had oxidized like the Statue of Liberty. So there's obviously things I would do differently now. See how this cartridge slot was connected through all this ribbon cabling? I don't know why I did that. It should have just gone over and up. Most of this wiring is thicker than it needs to be. It's a lot of joints. <laughs> um, oh, the switch is loose. I guess I'll have to fix that. Interesting. Um, here is the screen. You know, now we have little modules that are a lot easier to use. So, Well, you know, this was my first portable, so, you know, I, I, it could have been worse. So yeah, we're going to basically try to so we'll use the original design files and try to recreate this as close as we can to the original. I mean, it's going to be different. The screen's going to be bigger for one thing, but I think it'll still look pretty similar. It'll be like its grandson or something, or its son, or nephew, or niece. I mean, who knows what sex it is. I have obtained an Atari 2600. A really good place to get these is off eBay, usually around $35. This is the Darth Vader model because it's got black up here. And this was actually the first time they called it an Atari 2600 before. It was just called the video computer system. And then we want the one with four switches because the one with six switches has way too much circuitry inside. I mean, it was built like a tank, but not very good for making smaller. Screw is removed. Let's pop it open. So years ago when I first started modding, you know, this was my first project and you know, what I noticed on the Atari was, you know, most of the circuitry is right here inside this RF cage. All this stuff can be removed, which we will do. You still see this today in electronics, you know, there'll be a ground plane which connects to the RF shielding and covering up the real guts, which are these three things. And at the processor, your RAM and your timers, and uh, this makes the video. That's all there is to it. Time to slice and dice. Oh yeah, this brings back memories. A lot of this area is just solid ground plane, but there are areas where we are cutting off traces, so we have to keep in mind of that. Although, we don't need a whole lot of the stuff. We mostly need the um, one of the joystick ports and uh, the select reset switches. So, this is all pretty easy to rewire. Much easier than a modern game console. She'll never jump again. Believe it or not, it's been almost five years since I've done anything with the Atari 2600, so I can't quite remember everything, but I wrote it in my diary, so I don't have to remember. Junior. Okay, here's a schematic of the Atari that I downloaded off Atari Age, actually. You've got the three main circuits, the timer, RAM, processor, and the video. And then I have some diagrams here, which tell me how to remove the resistors and mod it into a uh, composite video output. 
Take a look at it from the side. Uh, most of the components are pretty flat and we don't need this thing, so you could actually flatten this out and make it um, fairly thin. You know what's weird about some of these old uh, circuit boards is when you desolder them, it smells exactly like Tang beverage drink. I really don't know why. Maybe it's because the astronauts had Tang and there's a space shuttle back then. I'm not sure. So see how I'm laying some of these components flat like this crystal? This will give us as much room as possible for other components and allow us to make the unit thinner overall. Now it's very important that we preserve these transistors here because what this old system did was it actually had, the crystal actually was the color clock. Now a color clock refers to the frequency at which an NTSC, NTSC signal changes color, which is only about 160 times per line. So the color clock is uh, 3.579545 megahertz. But the chip only runs at about 1.7 megahertz, so what they have here, they actually have a divider which divides this frequency and then feeds both the clocks at different rates off one crystal. So the timing was so critical back on the old Atari, the programmer basically had to draw the screen. There was a graphics chip, but all it did was send the data out to the screen. The programmer actually had to draw every scan line. So that's why you know the games would have less logic and whatnot, because you know, 80% of your time was spent drawing the screen. Now, nowadays you see games, homebrew games, with fancy graphics, and you say, why? Well, why couldn't they have done that back then? Well, the reason is a homebrewer can spend two years working on a game, whereas back, if you're working at Atari or something, you might have, you know, three months to make a game. So, you, you can only make it as good as you make in three months, so. So I put this over here because this is kind of wasted space anyway, so I'm just gonna use wires to connect it. It'll be fine. All right. See how everything's nice and flat now? It'll give us some more room to put things like our screen in. So what I'm doing is I'm removing some of these resistors so that we can make our own uh, <clears throat> resistor ladder for the composite video. However, I'm not removing them completely. I'm just attaching one lead. So in case I do this wrong, we can reattach them. But I'm just going off my old diagram here. So hopefully it's close enough. This isn't really the proper way to do solder things, but it works. The next step is we have to restore some of these connections around the edge to um, make sure the power and ground get to everything. Okay, there's power coming into the unit. And there's other spots where we need to ascertain ground. See right there how those two pins were connected to the ground plane? So those need to go to ground, as does that pin right there. So yeah, this kind of helps us put the puzzle back together. I mean, we can excise some of these connections, but not all of them. My favorite food is spaghetti. My favorite video game, still Fallout 3. Ask me to choose a favorite superhero and I'll go with Iron Man every time, or maybe Spider-Man. And we all know my favorite element is 14, but can you guess my favorite pie? Raspberry. And I'm not referring to the raspberry pie grandma used to make. I'm talking about a computing revolution being waged by Eben Upton and his colleagues at Cambridge University. Recognizing a need to revitalize and inspire the future of computer programming, Upton and his team have created the Raspberry Pi, a credit card sized computer that is both powerful, low cost, and perfect for educators, hobbyists, and those interested in designing and advancing applications and educational resources. This affordable, single board computer can be programmed to play HD videos. It can also be used for gaming, and will do most of the things PCs can do, like spreadsheets and word processing. It's perfect for a Linux install. Our sponsor, Element14.com, is one of the few places in the world where you can purchase this incredible innovation and also download the supported Fedora OS Linux image that can be loaded onto an SD card to get it up and running. Plus, the Element14 community is the perfect place to get technical documents, find accessories, connect with users and experts, watch tutorial videos, join in discussions, get support, and show others how you're putting your device to use. So if you're ready to learn more and take a B-Y-T-E out of Raspberry Pi, head over to element14.com forward slash Raspberry Pi and join the computing revolution today. This is just one more way that Element 14 makes it easy for engineers to be inspired and find the solutions they need to get the job done. And now, back to the show. So here I've replaced the resistors we pulled up with some new resistors, which will work better for our modern screens. Um, I put them all in line so you can barely even tell I did anything. Then here I added the color timing potentiometer, which we need to adjust the tint. So now we should have a good, stable picture on the screen. Next, we're going to hook up some batteries to it. 
Now, you may have seen these before. This is a linear power regulator. It takes a higher voltage then knocks it down to something lower that a circuit can use, such as 3.3 or 5 volts. However, these are not very efficient. But here we have a switching power supply package that I got from Element 14. It switches the power at very high frequency to create new voltages. In this case, it's 5 volts. So we've hooked it up to these batteries here. So this will power our unit off of battery power and do it as efficiently as possible. All right, so our screen turns on as well. And then we see here on the multimeter, we've hooked it up in series so we can see how much current it draws and it's drawing about 360 milliamps, which isn't too bad. So here I've crammed a bunch of components onto a control board and I will describe what they are. Here is the switching voltage regulator we saw in the last step. Now this is a digital potentiometer. Um, instead of having like a volume knob, what we do is um, we check the data sheet, which I have here on my phone. And uh, this one's pretty easy to use. You can use these up down buttons directly hooked up to this and then the wiper control is right here. So the audio from your unit comes into the digital potentiometer, which is represented by this on the data sheet. And then after you know your audio is leveled, then it goes into an LM386 amplifier, which is a very common uh, single channel amplifier. And that then drives a speaker. And this all is hooked up off of the main power supply. So if you hook this up to the Atari, we can get an example of it with sound and digital audio control. So we can measure it with a dial caliper and see how thick everything is. The total thickness is um, just under an inch. Um, but instead of being, the thing is we can't have two layers of half inch to make the case because we're gonna need a little bit of wiggle room. But I think we can get this to about an inch and a quarter total thickness. So that will give us plenty of room because you know we still need room for the buttons to click, a door for the battery, and uh, yes, room for wires. So here's the original unit, and here's the redesign that I'm working on. We can't make it exactly the same. One of the big reasons is because see how much bigger the screen is than this? I mean, which is a good thing, but it also changes the layout. But we can still keep the silver band. We can still have some wood down here, and we can keep the controls as you know close as possible. One difference is we're gonna have a, a volume control with buttons, so that will be different. And the new to unit will also be a little thinner than this one. But I think it's pretty close. I mean, considering that we're using different parts. So inside the unit, we have the LCD screen, we have the Atari, we have the batteries, and the controls. And I drew a side view of it so we can see how all the depths work. We have a good amount of space here. The thing that actually takes up space are the AA batteries, which are kind of primitive, but we know they'll work. And then you see the control board right here. It has a certain amount of rise to it, and then the buttons. So here's our new unit, and compared to the old unit, you can see it's a lot neater. It's almost like there's 12 more years of soldering experience between these two objects. Here, everything has been, pretty much everything's been put into one bunch of ribbon cables. This has the controls, the audio, and uh, two of the grounds. Then we have just a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, RCA cable here for the video, which gives it some shielding. They have power coming from the battery, goes to the switch, goes down to the linear, I'm sorry, the switching voltage regulator that we have which then goes to power the Atari and the screen. So yeah, we made everything nice and neat as opposed to this where I've got a joystick cable hooked up to it for some reason. Um, I rewired the cartridge slot, which I didn't have to do on this one because it's, you know, in one piece. So I didn't rewire the cartridge slot on this one. So yeah, you know, just, you know, it's all about making things more efficient. Using the flat flex ribbon cable like this, which you can get from Element 14, is a lifesaver. You just get what you need and you pull it out and yeah. I'm gonna use the V-bit to uh, drill these holes a little bit. If there's a V-bit you know, curve in it or indentation, it'll allow the screws to find their way into the holes better when we put it back together. Here's a classic game, Tapper. You gotta serve drinks to the thirsty patrons and catch the empties.
So advantages of this over the original unit, it's slightly thinner. It's obviously got a much bigger screen. It's got a digital volume control. It has a single power source instead of two different power sources like that one did. So yeah, it worked out pretty good. It's been a while since I've made an Atari, but it's still fun to build uh, these portable Ataris using the original hardware. So I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into how it was actually done. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be making some robotic luggage that can hopefully, in theory, follow you around the airport. We'll see you then. Go to element14.com forward slash TBHS and register to win today's build.